Hello, this is Marvin Glossfelty with another NGWA Industry Connected video. Today I want to talk about flow profiling a well. So by flow profiling, I mean we want to look at at what depth intervals does the groundwater come into the well, and then we can also look at things like what's the water quality. So this is a evaluation technique through which we can um, kind of fix a well that has poor quality water or maybe improve wells production. So kind of a complex issue. So I've got some uh, some video assist here, uh, some PowerPoint I'd like to use to sort of make this point. So here's our well. And of course, we know we have different strata that it may have penetrated. And that strata may all provide the same gallons per minute and the same water quality, or more commonly, it may be different. And so we can have water quality that is poor in some depth intervals. Here I'm showing nitrate, arsenic, and total dissolved solids being high in certain depth intervals. And then the rest of the depth intervals having pretty good water. That's not uncommon. So how do we know if we come to an existing well, how do we know this? If we go to a new well, we might do depth specific sampling or something like that, maybe sample as we drill, things like that. But if we got an existing well, how can we know what our situation is? Well, we can set up a, uh, an analytical setup like this. I'm showing a submersible pump um, here. It could be a vertical turbine pump, but a submersible is a little easier. Um, so we have the motor intake and our pump bowls. And this is a sounding tube above it where we can measure water levels just like normal. This is an access tube, usually about three inches or so in diameter, open ended at the bottom. This allows us to run wireline tools down past the pump while it's running and then evaluate our screened interval here. So the way this works is we turn on the pump, we get a little drawdown cone, we bring in our logger and he runs what's called a spinner log. A spinner is an impeller just like a uh, in a flow meter that's in a pipeline. So this is run down at a constant rate of speed and we're running the pump. So water's coming in and flowing up to the pump intake and as this tool flows past it we can measure the different gallons per minute that's coming in at different depths. And so in one day's time we can gather a whole lot of information from a well. So we've got a constant rate test. We're pumping at a constant rate, not for 24 or 72 hours, maybe for an eight hour or 10 hour day. But we can get some site specific aquifer characteristics estimated from that. We run this log and so we can get our different water producing intervals and where the gallons per minute coming in. And then we can use a sampling tool to grab water quality sample from these different depth intervals. So now we know a whole lot more than we did without spending a whole bunch of money so we can know how we could, let's say, for example, we might have a well with a little bit of high nitrate in the upper part of the aquifer. Where do we run the line or two? We could just guess and maybe not get rid of all the nitrate or even get rid of too much of the water productions. But here we would know what we're doing ahead of time and it's not too expensive, so it's a good approach. And this is the way it looks when you set it up. This is the Submersible pumps down the well. We have the electrical cable going to it. Here's our sounding tube here in the middle with a little sounder going to it, and that's our PVC access tube. So pretty straightforward setup. And this is what the spinner tool looks like, a little impeller. They come rather small these days, and they're, they're pretty good. And uh, they provide a strip chart like you see on the right here. Log counts per second uh, from left to right and then just depth interval. So the way to read these is in intervals where this is sloping, and I can show you where those are in blue here, where it's sloping, that's where as the tool goes downward, there's more gallons per minute passing it, it goes deeper yet, now there's less, now there's less, now there's less. And that, that means that where it's sloping, there's water production. Where it's straight up and down, it's like a blank pipe. There's not any new or any less water as the tool goes down. And so in this case, between about uh, 760 and 820 or so here, there's no new water production. It's about, it's kind of a dead zone, probably a clay zone. 
so we can know where our pay zones are, right? These are blue uh, zones here are our four pay zones in this particular well. And if we're going to look at the water quality, we would pick the top of each of these pay zones. And of course, each one of these is the water from that depth, that point, all the way down. Here's our, our, our tool that we use, just a stainless steel barrel. We pull a vacuum in it with a little vacuum pump, lower it down and open a little orifice and collect these water samples. Each one is from that point all the way to the bottom, of course, it's blended. There's no packers or anything to isolate these, but that's okay, we just do the math. We do a little mass balance. We know the gallons per minute, we know the water quality. The next gallons per minute, the total water quality, and so on. So we just do the math, and that's not tough. And so we can know what our water quality is um, in each of our depth intervals. This is how we can determine what's going on in the well. So there's another method to get the same information that I should mention, which is dye tracers. This is the setup, also very simple. Sometimes, depending on the uh, diameter and the uh, alignment of the well, you can even do it with the permanent pump still in place, because this is just real small tubing. And what they do is they come in, put this uh, little tubing down to various depths throughout the well, and put a little squirt of rhodamine dye. And this is NSF certified uh, stuff that is very fluorescent. And so when it comes out at the land surface, you don't see a blob of red or anything. You never see it. It can go directly into a potable system. But this fluorimeter, that's what this device is here, that measures this stuff at the parts per billion level. So even if you got a little bit of it, they know exactly when it arrives. And so once you know the velocity, you already know the cross-sectional area of your casing then you can say, okay, here's the gallons per minute and, and do it at many different depths. So you get the same information. You get the flow profile. And then the company that provides this also can provide a sampling tool. So in the same diameter, you can collect your water sample, get the same information as you did before. Real nice way to go. So <clears throat> getting into a little science here because it does impact what we're doing. Fancy words for simple concepts stratigraphy and anisotropy. Stratigraphy just means the layers. We have layered strata, okay? That's all that we're saying here. That means groundwater can more easily flow horizontally than it can vertically. But what about in a single area, within a single unit? If we look close at that, what we see is the sediment grains are more like dinner plates, they're elongate, than they are like spheres. And here's a photograph to show you, uh, I'm not making this stuff up. You can see these are elongate. So even within a coarse unit without a bunch of clay layers or anything like that, water flows horizontally uh, much easier than vertically, much easier being more than 10 times easier. Usually it's between 10 times, like uh, one order of magnitude to up to three orders of magnitude difference. So that's a big deal. That means that water is going to be moving horizontally a lot easier than vertically. And this is a good thing when we're trying to manipulate a well. That means that we can, even if we have just a coarse unit like this, we might be able to isolate, get rid of one layer and still receive water from the other layers. And those layers may have different water quality. So it's a good thing for us. But it means that what we can have go on is we can have different pressure zones, different static water levels, all within the same unit. And so, and here's a, just the cartoons to show horizontal, goes in a straight line, vertical, it has to take a more sinuous path. So there's kind of common sense behind all this. So what we can sometimes see is if we isolate an interval, this might be an open borehole, but it also could be a well, as long as it's isolated, we can see that there's a water level it's a little bit different than the regional water table. And so if we measure water levels, and we do this a lot of times in open boreholes when we're doing depth specific sampling, we will see something like this, where we have different water levels at different depths. And this can happen, as we see it commonly in agricultural areas because they're pumping water for their farms, they're putting it on crops, we have some uh, recharge coming back and so we're adding water to the top of the aquifer as we're removing it from the bottom of the aquifer and we develop these. In areas that are artesian, this is a downward vertical hydraulic gradient. We can have an upward vertical hydraulic gradient in some areas, so they can go either way, but they make an impact. 
out here in the aquifer, all these pressure zones will not commingle because of the anisotropy and stratigraphy that'll hold them apart. But if we put a well in, now we've connected the dots, haven't we? So what's going to happen? Water will flow from high pressure to low pressure. Now, now we've come along into our spinner log. What are we going to see? If we had high nitrate here, we'll see high nitrate everywhere. So that's why I'm going through all this. We have to be able to figure this out. And good news, we can figure it all out. So what do we do? We, we, we want to consider this, but uh, realize that it's not just that it commingles like this. It also impacts how we, um, if we put our pump in and we turn it on. It's also going to impact how we produce water. So we need to keep this in mind. Um, if we have the same permeability in all our strata, the same hydraulic conductivity, then Darcy's law tells us that multiplied by this cross-sectional area, which is in a well, the same up and down because we've got radial flow to the well, all that multiplied by the gradient is going to be how many gallons per minute come in. Well, these first two zones, we see that they have a static water level higher than the pumping water level. And the difference between the static water level and the pumping water level is the gradient in a pumping well, or this one's higher too. But what about this one? It's got a static water level almost the same as the pumping water level. And so even if it has a high hydraulic conductivity multiplied by a high cross-sectional area, multiplied by zero, the answer is going to be zero. It won't make a drop of water. And there's some zones could even have water flowing out while you're pumping. That's counterintuitive, but it happens in the real world. So all this needs to be considered. That's the reason I'm using these cartoons. It's not a simple concept, but it happens not uncommonly out in the real world. So how can we measure this? Well, that same spinner log setup we can do, there's actually ways to do it with the dry tape, the dye tracer as well. Uh, we can, without, with the pump turned off, we can run our spinner tool down and up at the same line speed. So downward and upward. So the red is showing the downward run. And this is an example well, this is an actual well from California, where at about 900 feet, we had water coming in and then flowing back out because of the vertical hydraulic uh, gradient, right? And so it turns out that when you have this V opening downward, it's where water is flowing inward. Where you have a V opening upward like this, that's where that same water is flowing back out. So in this well, we did a dynamic spinner. We saw all kinds of high nitrate down here, which we knew originated up here. So we were able to fix this well and brought it to within drinking water standards uh, without reducing its uh, water production. So there, there are ways, many ways to fix an old well. There's a this old house type of an approach, and it's a, it's a good thing to do. This is just a bit of a track record. It depends on the local situations, but this is for nitrate. <clears throat> uh, nitrate is nitrogen. Before in red, after in blue different amounts of, of improvement depending on the well and the local hydrogeology. But you can um, make things better. But once you've modified a well, once you've put a liner in there or used inflatable packers to modify it, you want to do some retesting because now you've changed everything. You've changed the hydraulics. Your pump may be off its curve, you know, things like that. You just want to re-understand your situation. So a little bit of testing is, is a good idea. So um, going back then to uh, flow profiling, there's there's a lot that I covered in my book I wrote, uh, The Art of Water Wells, but none of this stuff was covered. You know, you have to kind of, you know, land the plane at some point, and so I did before we ever uh, got to this. But maybe someday I'll I'll uh, I'll write another little chapter uh, because well rehabilitation. There's a lot of good information out there on it, but there's a lot that needs to be presented. And so uh, it's my privilege to talk to you guys about it today, and I hope you do well. Thank you.